Good morning and welcome to you all. It's great that so many of you could, could join both ADA and uh, one of our major stakeholders and capital partners for what I hope will be a uh, informative session. So many of you have contacted Sean and I across the past month or so, um, and we welcome that contact because it's provided both of us with a really good insight into some of the issues that you've, you've been facing. Now, we've tried to assist you wherever we can, but of course, as many of you have known, we've got limited capabilities, particularly around certain aspects of emotional support and financial support. So I'm really hopeful with today's seminar that although we may not be able to address all your um, queries, that we can at least make some forward steps for you in terms of coming, coming to terms with some of the issues that you're facing. I know reading some of the questions beforehand, you've had um, clinical questions and questions related to restrictions. Unfortunately, the panelists today are not necessarily in a position to address some of those. So that I ask that if you do have some very specific dental questions, that you address them with Sean and I after, after, the, uh, after the panel's finished today. That can be via um, email, telephone call, whatever. So it gives me much pleasure to hand over to David Andrew from Capital Partners, who's going to mediate this morning's session. Thank you, David. Thank you to you, David, and to the ADA. Um, welcome, everybody. And uh, I'm very pleased that you could join us this morning for this uh, information session. Um, we've had over 200 people register for today's session, so it's now up, for us, up to us to deliver great value for you. Um, we're aware that our audience is very uh, varied. Uh, about half the people registered are business owners and about half are contractors and employed dentists. So the panel's conscious of this, and we're going to be trying doing our very best to make the, the content relevant for all of you. Um, of course, we were as delighted as you were to hear the news yesterday that some of the practice restrictions um, have been lifted. And, and whilst we absolutely get that you are not in business as usual mode, at least it's a glimmer of hope and something that we can all look forward to with you. Um, it's a step in the right direction. Um, the goal of our webinar today is to really provide you with to access to experienced subject matter experts across the areas of clinical psychology, um, business advisory and wealth management. And whilst you might think that that is a bit of an eclectic mix of um, subject matter experts, th these issues are so interrelated, the, the psychology, the way we're looking at our money, the way we're trying to respond to these, these business issues that we face. But our goal is to help you think through some of the issues that you're facing at what we all acknowledge is a really tough time, and particularly for dentists. Um, before I introduce the panel, there's a little bit of housekeeping. Um, we want this in, uh, webinar to be as interactive as possible. Um, we've already had some really good quality questions uh, during the registration process, but we're obviously looking for a few more. So down at the bottom of your screen, you're probably becoming um, uh, experienced at all of this now. Uh, there's a Q&A button and uh, shoot off the question to the panel and we'll do our best to get as many as we can answered. So now let me introduce your panel for the day. First is Alex Hoff. Uh, Alex is a practicing clinical psychologist. Um, I've known her for 20 years and she's got over 35 years of experience in the government and the private systems. Um, for over 15 years, Alex headed the uh, employee assistance program at Woodside. Um, so there she dealt with the full catastrophe of issues for employees and their families and um, has particular expertise around accidents, emergencies, change fatigue, stress in the workplace. So I think Alex is really, really well placed to help you with some questions today. Um, privately in her practice today, um, she works with adults uh, in the area of anxiety, depression, trauma, bereavement and workplace stress. Our next panelist is Tony Manso, uh, whom I've also known for nearly 20 years. Um, Tony's an associate partner uh, in private client advisory uh, at EY. Uh, many of you will know of EY as Ernst & Young. Uh, like all big accounting firms, it changes its name regularly. Um, but he has over 30 years of experience working with small and medium businesses. Um, and importantly for us today, and I've seen this in action. Tony has core skill sets in, in business, business diagnostic, strategy, 
um, as well as in just helping business owners think through complex issues as well as being a chartered accountant. So he's a really valuable resource. Um, Tony's really well armed with um, COVID-19 information and insight um, from a client perspective and a business perspective. So, so we'll, we'll enjoy chatting with you, Tony. Our next um, panellist is Stephen Boyce. Um, Steve's a principal and wealth advisor with Capital Partners. He's also a member of um, the Capital Partners Investment Committee. So there's a few investment related questions that have already come through and I know Steve will be happy to respond to those for you. Um, Steve provides comprehensive wealth management advice for business owners and professionals, um, but has particular expertise in business and retirement transitions. So people who are selling their businesses, people who are thinking through, how do I actually retire? So a really good resource for, again, for you today. Um, very, very good at dealing with complex situations. And he today, right now, is on the front line of, of coaching people through these issues. Now, in the background, we also have Dan Rowe. Um, Dan is also from EY. Um, he's a tax specialist and he's on hand to help us if there are any specific tax questions. Okay, so I do need to remind everybody before we get into this um, that the webinar is general advice and um, of course we're not dealing with anyone's particular situation. So after the, um, the panel conversation, if you do have specific queries, um, you do need to go back to your own advisors to, to dig deeper. But alternatively, um, all of the panellists today are happy to be available to answer questions after the session. And um, towards the end, I'll let you know how you might be able to do that. Also, um, the EY, um, Tony from EY has, has very kindly agreed to distribute some really good information via the ADA. So you can look forward to that arriving in your inbox uh, shortly. So Alex, Tony, Steve uh, and Dan, thank you very much for joining us today. Alex, um, I'm going to direct the first question at you. And this is um, clearly a time of extreme uncertainty. Um, and there's the business issues and there's the family issues, but also there's huge professional issues for dentists. You know, um, where, where you've treated someone for 20 years and, and you can't respond to their clinical situation, their, their, their their problem. I wonder, I just wonder if you can help us make some sense of this emotional roller coaster that we're all on at the moment. Yes, thanks, David. Um, big question. I think I'll start by saying that we need to remember that we're hardwired for three primary things. We're hardwired, first of all, for safety. So, from an evolutionary perspective, all creatures need to feel safe in their environment. And then what, as, along with a couple of other creatures on the planet, quite a few creatures, we are also very social creatures. We're tribal creatures. So from an evolutionary perspective, we've evolved to be with others, to connect with others. And then that connects again with the, the final hardwiring, and that is we need to achieve things in order to feel good and to feel safe. So we're actually hardwired to be tribal creatures that achieve a lot. And if we're not tribal creatures that are achieving a lot, we don't feel very safe. And then what happens is our fight, flight or fright response comes up. And that means we often feel very angry about what's happening to us. We can feel very frightened and very anxious about what's happening to us. And we can also just feel helpless and overwhelmed. So it's, it's gonna depend partly on your situation in this particular pandemic, but also partly on family of origin, your own personality styles. So you get a range of reactions, but basically it's, it's, you've got to remember that it's appropriate to have an emotional reaction to what's going on. There's so much change, there's so much uncertainty, and human beings don't like that. We think we do, but ultimately we're all control freaks and we need to feel there's a certain amount of certainty and predictability in our lives. And when something like this happens, it can be very, uh, very unsettling very unsettling indeed. Um, so we see people are going through quite an emotional roller coaster. And I think that um, one of the things that you've highlighted already is that dentists like me, we work with our clients over a long period of time. So already you're losing some of your social connections. So that doesn't make you feel very good. But also like me, if you, um, like to achieve and you like to get things done you like to come home and think i've made a difference 
And I think dentistry is a, a job where you're actually helping people. You're helping them get over pain. You're helping them be more confident about how they look. It's actually very important work. And so you lose that. You lose that. But underscoring all of that is you've, you're losing business. You're losing money. And I never, ever underestimate how stressful financial stress is. When we kind of take it for granted in our society, and particularly, I guess, we're all professional people on this webinar, we kind of often don't think about that that much. But financial stress is very overwhelming. Suddenly you get very frightened about what's going to happen. And as you've said, some of the people I'm talking to are responsible for others. So that's a double whammy. You're not only responsible for your own income and your family, you're responsible for, for the work of other people. And so that can be very overwhelming. So the first thing I want to say is it's actually really appropriate to feel a bit anxious to the point of feeling quite frightened. It's actually very appropriate to feel quite sad about what's happening. It's really appropriate to feel actually grief stricken about what's happening because there's a lot of loss. And if you don't feel these things to some extent, I'd be surprised. And I know that we're later on, we'll talk a little bit about some of the strategies you can use, because I think there's some general principles that we can use to help us get through this. But I don't think you want me to talk about that right now, David. No, that's okay, Alex. That's a great kickoff. I think acknowledging just how everyone is feeling. And um, one of the things that I think is really, really um, a significant issue is that everyone's everyone's calling out how tough it is for hospitality everyone's calling out how tough it is for you know businesses that have been closed down there's no mention of dentists and um you're sort of the quiet um you know forgotten about because everyone assumes you're rich and um i know from my professional practice that there's a lot of money goes into establishing a dental practice and therefore there's a lot of debt so the um the issues are accentuated and and, and i think that's a nice lead into you tony um you know you're there's just no playbook for this is there you know to, to give people a you know a one page um a q a on on how they can deal with these issues is is not the answer um, so what's confronting dentists at a business level over the last probably month where it's really ramped up has been tough. Can you just unpack a little bit about how businesses should be thinking about this and how they should be responding? Yeah, thank, thank you, David, and welcome, everyone. I'm, I guess I'm somewhat happy to be here, although I would have preferred it to have been under much better circumstances, I guess. Um, in terms of what we're seeing, well, after... 30 years, I thought that I'd seen it all um, during this crisis, and it goes back to some of the commentary that uh, Alex has, has made. Um, we've seen a lot of panic, we've seen a lot of anxiety, um, we've seen a lot of irrational decisions, and it's understandable. I mean, people are under an immense amount of, uh, of stress and duress. So, I mean, there, there are businesses out there that are fighting for, uh, for, for survival. So. I guess our first piece of advice to clients has really been quite simple, um, and that's to try and remain calm and think rationally. And we say that for a number of reasons, but most importantly, we do believe that support is at hand. I get the sense that businesses won't be abandoned. Um, governments are intervening to ensure that businesses survive, households stay afloat, and they're pulling a lot of levers to manage, I guess, the fallout. Um, Landlords are flexing, banks are being very generous, and I mean, even banks are paying their part in terms of supporting their, uh, their, their customers and the, the broader economy. Um, and importantly, I think we see that uh, there's more support coming as well. I mean, if you think it through, governments have committed $340 billion just to put an economy into hibernation. Um, again, I think there'll be more stimulus required in order to kickstart the economy and then potentially additional funding and support in order to keep it going on top of that. I think here in WA, the government uh, has been relatively dormant in introducing some stimulus measures. I think there's more to come there as well. And let's not forget local government either, either because they're playing a small part as well. And I think they're probably looking to do more as well. So. In summary, businesses and whole households are being, I guess, surrounded with very, a very supportive environment and have been given every possible chance to survive. I mean, the caveat here is that, you know, for those households and businesses that were struggling pre-crisis, 
um, they're probably unlikely to, uh, to, to survive. Um, in terms of, I guess, limiting the damage and what we're advising clients to do, and I suspect that most businesses by now have dealt with the, I guess, the critical and urgent aspects that have, uh, have confronted them. Um, the initial shock and panic seems to have subsided. Um, a lot of businesses have dealt with uh, the well-being protection of their people. Uh, a lot of cases, in a lot of cases, they've either scaled back operations or reconfigured how they work. They've worked through some of the legal issues and, uh, and, and so on. So now I think at this point, and what will have a big say in how people, I guess, cope and how anxious they become, is really how well they plan for what's next. Um, and planning should be a crucial part of the next phase. Um, critical in this way, I guess, um, is, is data. You know, in the interest of data being the new black, you, you really do need to ensure that whilst you're planning, that your data is reliable, it's timely, and it's, uh, and it's trustworthy. That's essentially rule number one. Rule number two, and I guess we're going to break part of our own rule here because we're big proponents of things like three-way forecasting and budgeting. But under the current circumstances, you know, profit and loss and balance sheets are a little bit less relevant. It's all about cash now. Um, how can we preserve it? How can we manage it? And how can we improve it? So in cash flow modelling, we're recommending to start with a, with a, a worst case scenario. Um, you know, what if things don't change for three months and we're still where we are today? You know, where does that sort of leave you from a, a cash position perspective? Um, so that's your starting point. Um, once that's been quantified, I guess it becomes an exercise of working back backwards through sort of a line by line assessment of expenses and, and, and commitments. And really, I guess this exercise can be just as effective in a household context as it is in a business one as, as well. So, you know, has all non-essential and unnecessary expenditure been eliminated? Has CapEx been put on hold? Are there liquidity opportunities? Can credit terms be extended or renegotiated? You know, should you draw unjoined facilities before banks cancel those uh, those facility limit, limits? Um, Tony, Tony, just a question. Um, I've dealt with a lot of dentists over the years and I really admire, and, and medical people too, I really admire their technical um, expertise, but sometimes they have no interest in or have had no interest in, um, and sometimes they don't have the skills. Like you don't learn business modelling at um, dental school. So how, how do people take that first step? Well, I think it's, uh, it's the support of those around you. I mean, your first port of call is generally to, to go to your, to your advisor. And um, I'm a big proponent of knowing a lot about what goes on in your business. So sure, uh, you know, you might have home builders that know a lot about building houses. You have dentists that know a lot about dentistry. But I think if you're a business owner, you've got to know a lot about what's going on in your business. You know, it could stem from financial, from technology, all the way through to obviously cultural and people issues as well. So first step is to, to sort of sit back and talk to those around you. Um, and that might even involve a conversation with um, obviously your bankers. And I made the point previously that um, they've been really generous in this current environment. And I'll... I'll just touch on a, on a case study, on an example. Um, we had an organisation that was um, was in a fixed fee facility. Um, the facility wasn't fit for purpose, high interest rates. Um, it was a case where the banks actually came to the table to talk through the break fees to start with. Um, they ended up renegotiating, refinancing, which in, I guess I'll use hypothetical numbers here, but it the outcome was that the client actually saved $50,000 in interest for the year. But more importantly, it meant that they were in a cash positive position to the tune of about $200,000 as a result. So I think that was a, a really good outcome for the client and for the bank because the, the trade-off was that they, they ended up extending the term of that, uh, of that facility as, as well. So what I'm hearing there is you've just got to list, list out all of your issues the first is from you alex take a deep breath <laughs> pause then from you tony it's list out all of the issues and try and get some clear thinking around it and then speak to your landlord speak to your bank speak to whoever you owe money and 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 start the process of of coming up with a, a deal yeah um, 
Well, now, look, David, don't, don't, don't un underestimate what the actual process can do as well. So once you're going through a fairly formal financial modelling exercise, well, the outcome might be a lot better than what you had anticipated. So we go back to that point around how anxious people end up being. Um, I think if you do this and you do it properly, you'll probably find that um, not only decisions and solutions where they may exist become clearer and clearer, mm. the final outcome might be much better than what you're, you're thinking it, it actually is. Yeah. So one of the challenges, and I think this is really important, this is actually from the audience. Um, one of the challenges, you know, our business is down and your business will be down a bit and Alex, yours is down a bit, but, but dentists are down a lot. So JobKeeper becomes a really, really important thing. And I don't know if you want to respond to this, Tony, or whether, Dan, you want to. Um, the question from the audience from David is, once a practice is eligible for the JobKeeper payment, do they, do they stay eligible for the six months, regardless of um, in the income increasing? Because obviously, as level two restrictions, you know, as restrictions are lifted, people want to get back to work and people need their teeth fixed. So how's that going to work in terms of ongoing eligibility? Dan, I think you're much better equipped to answer this than I am. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in there. Um, hi, everyone. So um, the answer is it depends on your business structure. So if you're a sole trader, um, you will have a monthly reporting obligation. You'll have to provide or prove your eligibility on a monthly basis. However, if you're operating via another business structure, whether that be a company or a trust, um, once you prove your eligibility, you'll be eligible for the full six months. Yep. Okay, that's that's great. Thanks, Dan. And, and an important one in terms of um, really getting that advice. One thing we're finding, not just from our dental contacts, but uh, I spoke to a dentist last night, a, a really good friend of mine, and he just said it's so confusing. It's so confusing. I think that I think it's really important for us to acknowledge that as as a little bit of time passes, and it probably won't be much, that mist will clear because we're still in that phase of you know what does it all mean? That that mist will clear. So so the clear thinking I think becomes really really important. Yeah, and David, just in in regard regards to the job keeper, it is a bit of a um, evolving. Uh, situation. So while the ATO and the government have released a lot of information, there is still some detail to come. Mm -hmm. And EY has been liaising with Treasury to clarify some areas of contention. So you, you're very much right. It is a bit of an evolving situation. Yeah. Okay. I've got another tax question here, but I think I'm going to come back to that later. Steve, I, I want to move to you because given the dynamic and the age breakup of the uh, audience we, we asked for specifically on registration, um, we know that there will be people in the audience who have really well laid plans. There'll be people with no plan and you're going to need to get one, I suspect, but there'll be people with really well laid plans, whether it's, you know, buying a house or, or, or building, you know, really working towards retirement. Um, you know, for some people, I guess it's going to be a bump in the road, but, but what, what are you, what are the conversations you're having with clients around this? Yeah, thanks, Dave, and, and hi, everyone. So I'm just going to split that into two parts. So the, the conversation between people who are approaching retirement, so between five and 10 years, away from retirement and also for the younger, what I'm going to call the younger generation. So for people approaching retirement, I think a really important thing to note is that um, there's this concept of like diminishing human capital. So the closer you get towards retirement, um, the less, or the, the closer you get to being at a point where you actually need to fund your lifestyle from your investment assets, rather than being able to generate an income and fund your lifestyle from generating income either as a business owner or as a dentist. So the older you get, the closer you get towards towards retirement, pretty much there's no second chances. So if you're younger, you know, you can afford to make a few mistakes and you can recover from that over time. The closer you get to, towards retirement, the more that you actually need to make sure that you're making smart, well-informed decisions and that, um, you know, you're getting the right advice and you're doing the right things to put yourself in the best position because, you know, it's a lot harder to recover. Um, when your, you know, essentially when your income disappears. So I think the absolute key piece, and I think Dave, you touched on this, is just making sure 
that particularly as you're approaching retirement, you have a really, really well-tested um, strategic plan in place. And a lot of people will have some, you know, some thinking in their minds around, oh, you know, well, uh, you know, I might retire at age 60 and I think when I retire, I might, you know, be drawing down $100,000 a year. And so a lot of people, there's, you know, a lot of different ideas going on in their head. Um, but what I'd say is, you know, this is just an absolutely really amazing opportunity at the moment to put in place a plan where you really think strategically about well, what are my goals? Um, you know, so for example, you know, I'm wanting to spend $150,000, you know, per annum in retirement or want $50,000 on top of that for, you know, for holiday. I want to be able to help the kids, all those different things. Um, and then when you're really clear around what you're heading and what you're seeking to achieve, I'm putting together a really detailed financial model, like similar to what Tony was talking about from the business perspective, we'd be doing this personally as well, a really detailed financial model to give you clarity and confidence around, well, if I stick to something for a period of time and I have a strategy in place, that I'm going to be okay and I'm going to be able to achieve the things that I want to achieve. So my big message for, um, for people today, particularly the ones approaching retirement, is get a plan, get a strategy in place, something that's going to be time tested and something that, you know, where you're going through periods like this, you know, where, for example, equity markets are down between 15 and, and 40%, um, depending on which ones you're looking at across the globe, um, that needs to factor in these events happening because they will happen. You know, we saw the GFC, we saw, um, you know, the tech crash in the 2000s, we saw the 87 crash. There's always going to be shocks to the system. So it needs to factor in that these events are going to happen and a plan to actually be able to deal with that over time. Yeah. Um, for, for younger people, um, it really is, so it, it's a similar message in terms of, you know, it is also important for yourselves to have plans in place and think strategically around where you're heading and what you're seeking to achieve. I think with a lot of um, younger people that we speak to, um, particularly kids of our clients and, and people kind of in that younger generation, it's actually a lot more about really good habits. So how are you saving money? How are you, you know, when the money comes into your account, every month, how is it getting distributed out? Um, and just getting into good habits and reinforcing those habits over time and actually having a bit of a plan and a strategy around, around where you're heading is, um, is really useful. So, so Steve, that sounds like a good conversation. It sounds like to me in order, and, and, and it, like, if this wasn't planned, um, you know, get your head clear, get your business straight, then get your personal affairs straight. Um, I am going to ask you to comment on, uh, it's related to a point that Tony made, and that is um, I, his case study. Um, one of the things that's really helped this situation, everyone's talking about the government um, stimulus, you know, job keeper and job seeker and the, the bonus payments and the like. Very few people pay much attention to what's happened with the Reserve Bank and what's happened with interest rates. Can I ask you very quickly to share your professional experience about what happens when you know, someone presents to you, for example, with a set of loans, just to reinforce Tony's point, just what can be done when you go back to your bank and have a really good conversation with the bank to say, look, is this really the best deal you can do? Yeah, so I think, I mean, I'm a very big proponent in, um, you know, when you're, looking, when you're looking at a financial plan, you have to look at each individual component really thoroughly. And um, debt is just a really fascinating one, particularly for doctors and dentists, because... Um, everyone would know, everyone on this call probably knows that, you know, there's banks and there's financial advisors and there's all kinds of people, um, you know, who are always kind of in the faces of, of, of um, medical professionals in particular around loans and around debt. Um, it just seems to be almost like an easy target for people, for the big banks to be lending money to. Uh, but absolutely, Dave, you're, you're completely correct. Where you have, A, you could have a really good mortgage broker or B, if you're dealing directly with the banks, the the benefit from, you know, at the very least being well informed, speaking to someone around, you know, what interest rates you should be getting charged and then, um, you know, having a proactive conversation either through your mortgage broker or through a bank, it can just save, um, you know, really significant, amount, significant amounts of money um, yeah. just by, it's such a simple thing, but just by yeah. having the conversation and being proactive about it. And, and Tony made a very wise point. Point, I think about you must you must know what's going on in your business and um, it's it's quite common that people turn up to us and I'm sure you see the same Tony with loans that are just so out of date and the bank 
you are not going to get a phone call from your bank saying, oh, by the way, there's a new loan of, a, a rate available. You should be on it. It's not going to happen. So you need to be the one making the call to the bank saying, I'm in difficulty. I need to do, I need to come to an agreement around how I can, you know, restructure all of this. Um, that's great. Thanks, Steve. Um, a question for you, Alex. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd like you to touch on, I, I think one of the challenges we're facing today as a panel is exactly the same problem that, the, um, that our audience faces. And that is, you know, we are not talking about a 10% reduction in business. We're talking about 100% to near zero. And our level two restrictions will help. But can you just help us with, A, you know, you touched on earlier the role that work plays in our life and the importance of achievement, the importance of being goal seeking, all of those sorts of things. Um, but work does play an important role in our lives. And, and now when work is not there, that's causing a lot of stress. Now, in, in one sense, the work's not there. So you've got time to deal with some of these other issues that, that Tony and Steve are advocating. But gee, that's a, that's a tough gig. How do we get through this period together when work is such a big part of our lives our professional identity has been challenged to the core yeah very good question david and i think i did touch on it a little bit before i do think that i also just want to throw this in if i may one of the things i'm very mindful of and i suspect a lot of the people in our webinar today feel a bit angry about is that there's a lot of um there's been a lot of advice throughout the world on how to manage working from home. Only dentists haven't been able to work from home. And so it's like a double whammy. And so I think that I just want to throw that in that I'm really aware that unlike some of my clients who can work from home, you haven't been able to work from home. So you haven't even got, you have, some people still get that sense of achievement. They're just missing out maybe on the socialization and they're overwhelmed by kids and all that other stuff. So I just want to throw that in. I think that, the, the thing is that it's achievement, it's social connection, and it's meaning. It, it work adds meaning to your life. And I think that that's what we forget. The other thing about the social connection about work, it's not just your colleagues, it is your clients. And I've got to also have been thinking about this. What is it about work that gives us that social connection? Is it that we're all best friends with our colleagues? My experience is we're not always best friends with our colleagues. Is it that we love our clients? Well, I certainly think a lot of us have a lot of fun with our clients and we do really get attached to our longer term clients. But I think what's interesting about relationships at work is in one sense, they're structured. So they're kind of easy. You have a kind of, prof you have professional relationship with your client, you have a professional relationship with your colleague. And that just kind of fills that, that, that hardwired need very easily. And when that's taken away, you don't even re realize for a while what you've just been taking for granted. And that's why when you are no longer able to work for whatever reason, you really have to do a lot of what Tony's been talking about. You have to have a plan. You have to start doing what you can to make up for that loss of social contact. But the other thing that has to be, I think I want to overlay on all of this is you have to, when you're at work, it's pretty structured and you feel like you've got a reasonable amount of influence and control. You can, you know, that, you lose that now. Suddenly you get up, there's a lot of chaos on the news. It's, there's no good news and you're feeling very out of control and you can't even talk to people face to face that you normally would get that support from. So it's really quite, quite overwhelming. So one of the things I think it's really important is to think about, you have to be prepared to actually make a plan for coping without work for as long as it takes. You actually have to structure things in a way that you've always just taken for granted. So you have to think about how can I make up for achievement at home? How, what can I be doing at home to still give me that sense of purpose? That still give me a sense at the end of the day that it hasn't been a wasted day, I've actually got things done. I think that's very important. And also how can I do things in my day that still give me that social uh, support that I need and also to somehow give me a sense of meaning. So the things that I would really encourage people to do is have a plan and follow the general principle of what are the things that I can control? What are the things that I do have some influence over and get started on those? So I don't, Tony's spot on about the business model. What he's saying is start having a plan. What can you get 
information on? What can you start to influence? But you can do that in, your, in what I call your personal life. So that notion of in the day having structure, thinking about what needs to be in my daily plan, what needs to be in my weekly plan, because that's what work actually does for you. When are you exercising? How much sleep are you getting? What social contacts are you having? And what are you doing that adds value to your day? What are you doing that makes you feel like you have a sense of purpose? They're all very important things. And if you don't do those things, you just keep feeling distressed. The other thing I want to throw in here, if I may, is that psychologists are probably the only people who talk a lot about emotions. And I want to re really say to you that dentists, I suspect, like to think of themselves as pretty rational beings. They're very good technically at things. They're very good problem solvers. They're intellectually bright people. But you can't get your intellect to work effectively if your emotions are up. We have a very simple model in psychology that says if your emotions are up and you're feeling overwhelmed and emotional, your intellect will come down. So what's important, that one of the first things you have to do is be prepared to acknowledge how you're feeling to validate those feelings and to do some appropriate self-soothing. Appropriate doesn't mean a bottle of scotch every day, but it is important that you think about what's an appropriate way of self-soothing because the model simply says this, as your emotions start to settle, the intellect will come up and then you can do the kind of planning and problem solving that you need to do to get through this time. But if you're still a bit over the, all over the place, that's going to be very hard. It's going to be very hard to have those, those rational plans. So that's the reason we psychologists are actually encourage you to don't bottle things up. What we want you to do is express how you're feeling appropriately, talk to people, acknowledge it, take yourself for walks and gradually allow these to settle so that then you can actually make the plans. Because it's very important. I'm a, I'm a very practical person and I really do believe that what is going to help people is to have in the morning they get up and they, they've got things they've got to do. They're starting to feel more in control. They know what they actually are able to do to help themselves. Our control is going to be limited. So you have to think, well, what can I do to control? You know, what can I still control? What can I influence? And do that because you'll feel better. That will fulfill that achievement bit. But it's also important to keep in contact with other people. Luckily, we live in the age of this. We can do virtual contact. But I still think it's important, if you can, to have those meetings of two. I still think it's really important to check in on neighbours, to arrange to meet a friend for a walk. We're allowed to do some things. Do those things that give you a chance to make connection. Talk to those people that you feel safe about sharing how you're feeling. Because in doing that, your emotions will settle, your reasoning will come up, and you're about to do the very important things that the rest of the panel are talking about, which is very important. You know, we, I'm, I, it's not just about feeling good about stuff. We have to be earning an income. We have to be managing our business. And so I think it's really important to realise that the reason it's, that psychologists talk about acknowledge how you feel, deal with your feelings appropriately, is because we want that to be able to settle for you so that this will come up and you can get on with your life. Yeah, that's great, Alex. That's really fantastic. Thank you. Um, one, one of what it's really interesting um, reading through the Q and A, the questions that are coming up. There's a lot of questions about the um, the, the job keeper. Obviously, you know, there's no surprise here because we, we know you, you, you're desperate to keep your businesses on a, on a level, the, the most level keel that you can, but also you feel a sense of responsibility. Um, and there's a weight around that for the people who work for you. So not only for your own financial well-being, but you, the people who, who have supported you over many years. So before I ask you the next question, Tony, I, I do want to just check in with Dan. It's, it's similar to the question we had previously, um, but it's with a return to uh, level two restrictions and therefore an increase in activity, which is great. Um, when staff come back on, um, at what point, will the practice become ineligible for continued job seeker payment? Now, I get, I get that that job keeper payment, I'm sorry, I get that, that um, um, we might be in that zone of fug where we can't really see all the answers to this yet because the government doesn't know the answers yet. But I, can you help David with that question? Uh, yeah, so as I touched on earlier, there's, there's a differentiation between how the job keeper works if you're a sole trader as opposed to operating through a business entity with employees. 
Um, so assuming you're a business entity with employees, if you have, um, there are three different methods to prove the reduction in turnover. And if you've met one of those um, reduction in turnover methods, you will be eligible for the full six months of JobKeeper. That's if you're an employing entity, not a sole trader. So um, the answer is, um, it depends on your business structure, but um, if we had have a separate conversation outside of this Q and A, um, I can tell you um, exactly how it how it would apply to to your situation, David. Uh, Daniel, that's really kind of you. There's also a very complex um, question around trust distributions and um, streaming streaming income through a service trust, and, and I don't think we can answer that online. So that one might be coming your way too, Dan. Um, I want to, uh, I'd like to, um, just a, a quick one for you, um, Tony. Um, there's been a lot of stimulus, um, you know, where, where we're really looking for our way out of this. We all accept that there will be a way out, even though the weight of this is, is a challenge. Um, you know, you've got an enormous amount of resource at your fingertips being part of EY. Can you can you just give us a sense of what the Brains Trust are thinking at EY? What's the way through this? How what's the economy likely to look like afterwards? And and if you've got it, I know this is the million dollar question. Any sense of timing around what it might look like? Yeah. So again, a fairly simple response, David. Um, from an economic perspective, dark clouds as far as the eye can can see. Um, this this is a health issue, and until we fix the health problem. I guess the economic and financial damage will continue to, to, to escalate. Um, I mean, we've seen consumer and business confidence being decimated. Um, you know, we're sort of estimating that uh, that our economy will contract in the next six to 12 months from anywhere from between six and a half and, uh, and, and 10%. Obviously the quantum, quantum of employees required pre COVID-19 won't be the same post COVID-19. So, Unemployment slightly to uh, to remain high. Obviously, the Reserve Bank has come out and said that it's probably going to sit above six percent. Now, does that mean six point one percent, or does it mean ten percent? Um, again, at some point, governments will need to pick up the pieces. Banks need to be repaid. Um, it just goes on and on. And I think for me, the bigger concern is how it will change, I guess, consumer and business behaviour. Um, I guess there will probably be a bit more of a focus on on savings which means that it puts a, a strain on money flowing through the, uh, through the economy. So um, all very negative, I know. Um, I guess the other aspect is that we've obviously had those industries that got hit hard fairly early. So aviation, aviation tourism, hospitality, we saw the next wave being retail and I guess practitioners. There's also those lag industries that have got pipeline at the moment, but ultimately will probably fall away. So again, all of this tends to point to a prolonged sort of downturn and a, a very slow recovery. And I think I've, um, I've seen a number of sort of symbols used in terms of trying to explain the recovery. So the, the V shape, the U shape, the L shape. I actually like the tick. So essentially a fairly sharp sort of decline and then just a, uh, a gradual recovery. Um, mm. So, what do people need to do? Uh, again, I think in some instances where we're in this state of flux at the moment, people are sort of sitting around waiting for what's next. I think it's a, a fabulous opportunity for, uh, for people to sit back and look at the broader sort of strategic planning aspects for, uh, for their, their businesses. So ultimately, um, you know, what does, the, what does that tend to entail? Well, you know, let's stop looking at planning through the rear view mirror, for example. You know, let's put a forward focus on planning. Um, I think um, obviously conversations need to sort of be had around, um, you know, planning for recovery, focus on lifeline issues. You know, what better place to start than your customer, your clients or your patients? Think about how you'll re-engage with them. Will you be sitting around waiting for the phone to ring? or will you be hitting the ground running, I guess? Um, is there an opportunity to reconfigure or reinvent the customer or patient experience? Um, is your value proposition the best it can be? So these are obviously not financial planning, financial management 
aspects, they're more broader sort of business planning aspects and opportunities. Tone, a really practical question that I've been asked twice now, um, and there's a there's a there's a there's a theme of this in a question in the panel in the in the Q and A, and it's um it's along the lines of, gee, I'm trying to get the help I need, but my I think I get the sense that my um, my advisor's been looking in the rearview mirror. Now I'm asking my advisor to look at my accountant and say to look in the through the windscreen and help me look through what the future might look like. I'm I'm really finding them wanting. Um, I don't know if you can help with that or Steve, but what, what do you, how, you know, I, I get to this point where I know a lot of dentists are brilliant technicians, but, but some of the stuff we're talking about does not come naturally to them. How, how can we help with that? I think it's a, it's a case of uh, delving into our networks. David, obviously you're reasonably well connected. I've been in business for 30 plus years. Um, you know, if, if we're not the people for you, I'm, I'm certain there'll be people within our networks that, that will be able to, to help. Um, but, if, but if I could just make a, a final point with regards to, to, to planning and sure. I guess successful businesses tend to put the intangibles at the top of their agenda. So in this current environment, we're seeing the reputations of many purpose-driven organisations being decimated because of the way they've actually responded to the crisis. So when you're dealing with planning, you need to look for mechanisms that ensure that your reputation remains intact and you stay true to your purpose and your values. Um, now, whether that be through a crisis, a recovery, a boom, a recession, or just a normal economy, uh, you may find that that's the difference between those businesses that survive and thrive and those that essentially don't. So we've probably uh, we've probably run out of time on this uh, particular question, yeah, so I might just throw back to you. Tom. That's okay. Steve, I, there's a really important piece, and, and there's about four questions in the Q&A that, that all relate to this, and that is, you know, along the lines of, gee, at some point this is going to be a great investment opportunity. How, what, what, you know, and I think there's two sides to that question. One is I'm feeling really, really anxious about the investments that I've got versus, you know, is there an opportunity? I know timing of markets is hard, but this is your area. You know, you're on the investment committee. How, how should people be thinking about these sorts of things? Yeah, I think it's a really good question, David. It's one that we're getting a lot from our clients as well. Um, and also, you know, obviously people that I know from, um, you know, from my networks are asking that question, those types of questions a lot as well. So I think I really want to bring it back to the fundamentals of how you actually need to construct the portfolio. What's going to give you the best possible chance of having a successful investment outcome? Um, and the, the starting point always needs to be where you invest money in any asset class, whether it's you know, a diversified portfolio or shares or property, whatever it is. Um, what are we really seeking to achieve from this portfolio? So as an example, as someone who's younger, um, who's putting money into superannuation. You know, that's money that's probably going to be invested for 30 or 40 years before you can even access it. So with those styles of portfolios, you can just, you, you know, you can be seeking capital growth. You can be invested in a really growth orientated way for a long period of time, um, knowing that you're going to ride the ups and the downs of the market. Um, for someone who's approaching retirement, it's slightly different because you'll still need a component which is going to be, um, you know, invested for capital growth because, you know, if someone retires at 60, there's a likelihood they're going to need their money to last them for, you know, still for another 30 or 40 years. But there's also going to be, need to be a requirement for investment into defensive assets as well, like bonds and cash. Um, so the starting point is, what's the plan? Um, what's the purpose of this money that, that I'm investing? And then the second point is asset allocation. So the, the biggest driver for return for for anyone, particularly with a diversified portfolio, is asset allocation. So the percentage of wealth that you've got in growth assets and the percentage in defensive assets. Um, obviously, the more you've got in growth assets, um, the higher the long-term expected return, but also the increased volatility as well. So you have to be able to, where you invest in growth assets, you have to be able to ride through the ups and the downs and have a really long-term approach. Where you invest in defensive assets, we know that the expected return is going to be lower, um, but there's also going to be less volatility. So matching your investment strategy and your asset allocations to your goals is really important. Um, the, the third part, once you've got that sorted out, is really making sure that the investments that you do invest in are robust, they've been well thought through, and they're actually 
likely going to deliver the long-term returns. So people who are in highly diversified portfolios, um, which are you know, largely going to be tracking where the markets are going, and they've got the long-term approach, they can afford to hold those growth assets for the long-term and ride through the ups and the downs. For them, the conversation is actually really easy. So it's, it's like we've got the planning in place, we've got good quality investment assets, and we're just going to ride through this because we know there's going to be ups and downs with markets we're going to ride through this. Steve, um, Steve just quickly, um, um, with the way markets are, so they've gone down a fair bit and they've bounced back a bit and now they're down a bit again and it's, it's you know, all over the place. Um, if someone, there's a specific question here about this, you know, if someone's got money to invest, the lucky one, you know, someone has got money to invest, how should they be thinking about the market right now? And we, we are in a bit, we, I just need you to be quick on this one because we're nearly out of time. So, so we, our investment committee's done a lot of work around this, um, you know, before this crisis, but also throughout this crisis as well. Um, essentially, there's still so much uncertainty in the market. So we don't know where markets are going to go in the short term. Um, you know, everyone's got an opinion on it. You know, you turn on the TV, someone's saying it's, you know, going to steady and go up. And some people are saying this is going to be a next depression and the market's going to pull significantly. So we think a, a, if you've got cash on the sidelines and you're stepping into equities, we think a staged approach over a period of time. So probably around 12 months, so monthly incremental approach into the market over 12 months, months is probably a good starting point, Dave. Yeah, okay, that's great. Thanks, um, Steve. Um, we are coming to the end of our set time together. Um, so if you do have any other final questions, then uh, make sure you shoot them through. We've got a couple of minutes, Dave. Um, there's another, there's a, there's, there's another, there's a couple of questions in the feed about trusts. Um, one, one of them is, you know, which Steve responded to, you know, is asset protect, you know, is, is a trust still a good, um, a good vehicle for asset protection? Um, generally speaking, yes, but a, a, as, as always with, a, with, with advisors like us, the answer is, is prefaced with, but it, well, well, sorry, it comes with, but it depends on your situation. Um, there's, there's been quite a number of questions on the JobKeeper payment, which, uh, which I think, Dan, you've answered well, um, uh, given, given the uncertainty. Um, there's, there's a, there is a question here that I'm just going to deal with straight away, and that's with the JobKeeper payment. Um, does the employee have to be on the payroll already? Um, and also, there's another one, you know, do, do, do the, does the employee claim it or the, the, the job keeper, to, does the employer claim it? They're, they're actually pretty easy ones. And, and I think part of, the, part of the issue here around Tony's point about you've got to know what's going on in your business. Um, part of the issue here is get online, have a look. The, the resources are actually okay. That they are confusing, but you read through, read through some of the, um, the information. And, and, and my only comment on some of these questions that I'm seeing, the way they're being posed, is if you put those questions to a professional advisor, it's going to be a very expensive answer. If you if you do a little bit of research yourself and 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 spend a bit of time coming to terms with what's the right question to ask, then it's much, much easier for uh, um, your professional advisors to assist you with that. And, and David, sorry, I just want to jump in there. So um, it's important to note that the deadline to apply for JobKeeper is the 30th of April. So it's next week. So if you think you may be eligible, you need to really get on top of this and speak to your accountant or do some research online. Um, the team will share my contact details. So if, if you want, I'm happy to just, just give me a call and I'm happy to chat through um, some of these issues with people. If they want to give me a call, I'm completely relaxed about that. Um, but it's just, it is imperative that due to the, the timing of this, that you start understanding whether or not you're eligible and you make uh, that application prior to the 30th. Okay, well, that's very generous of you, Dan. I hope you know what you're getting yourself into. There's nearly, nearly 200 people on this call. <laughs> yeah, hopefully I don't get 200, but um, no, I am, I am, these, are, these are unprecedented times and I think we all have a responsibility to sort of help out um, where we can. So, and, yeah. and I really, really appreciate that generosity and spirit. Um, I'm going to finish off with a question for you, Alex, if you don't mind. Um, and, and we don't have long, but if you can just give us a couple of minutes on 
you know, we're going to get through this. Um, how can we be future focused? I think there's been some awesome, awesome suggestions about how people can be thinking about these issues, how they can get plans in place and so on. How can we be focused on being future focused and positive through all of this? I think it, um, I think it goes back to, to values. I, I'm, I was listening to Tony talking about this is an opportunity to kind of recalibrate and to really get a business plan and to think about the direction and it might, this is an opportunity to maybe be a bit more forward thinking. And I like that because I thought that's the kind of conversation I have and my colleagues probably have too with our clients a lot about this is an opportunity to not just look at your work. I know I've been saying, don't get me wrong, work is important. But a lot of my clients have said to me, this is almost like having a sabbatical from life. It's like, it's pushed me back so much on my heels that I'm, I'm really sort of starting to rethink about, is my life going in the direction I want? And I'm going to be really simplistic here. Just things like Australians are huge travellers. And that realisation, we might be about to leave our state for a while and suddenly recognising, well, what's actually important to us? What is important? Does it matter if I don't get to go skiing in Aspen? So this, for me, the notion of getting through this is to kind of take the opportunity, you, you might not have long, take the opportunity to think about the direction your life's going. Is this one of those, I always think of, you know, uh, what's the famous thing? The, the Chinese characters for a crisis, a threat and opportunity. We are feeling threatened. But these threats are, are always an opportunity to recalibrate not just our work, but our family life, our own inner life. What's actually important for me? And what's been interesting with my clients is that they've got practical concerns, but they often, it's often about what, does my, what is my life all about? What's actually important to me? And I think it's really important that we don't feel overwhelmed. We think, wow, this is a bit of an opportunity perhaps to recalibrate. We run on automatic so much in our lives. And one of my, my constant challenges to my clients is, what about running in manual for a little while? I wonder if you just ran, run in manual, what you might discover. This is like forced manual. We don't mm -hmm. like it when we're forced to do it, but it's forced manual. And a lot of my clients have needed it. They've actually said to me, it's, oh, I'm panicking, but this is an opportunity. And I think we need to look, take it in maybe short bits, have a general view of where we want to go, but also each day think, what am I going to do today that I know is going to help me rebuild my life? And maybe I'm going to try some things. I'm going to run some experiments and actually shift my direction slightly. And this might be great. I was so busy and so caught up in my automatic life. I didn't even know I had this opportunity to think about things in a slightly different way. Thanks, Alex. That's very, very wise counsel. Um, one final comment. Um, I, do, I know from my conversations with David and Sean, there's a lot of anxiousness um, out there for our younger graduates and our younger uh, people in the workforce. Um, you know, you're looking at a guy with terrible eyesight and a bald head, and I'm, I'm here to tell you that, that you will look on back on this as a, as a, as a, a really painful experience, perhaps. But in the context of your life, this will be a blip in the road. And I need, you to, I need you to know that. And it, it's not going to be easy for a short period of time. It's not going to be enjoyable for a short period of time. But, but you will look back and you say, oh, okay, you know, I learned from that. For those of you who are older and have a lot more complexity in your life, um, the business owners, those people who have got significant family commitments, we wanted to provide you with a forum to hear from some subject matter experts and also to... Um, get a sense of what you should be doing next. So my quick key takeouts were, you need to stop and pause. Thanks, Alex. You need to get a plan um, for your business and how you're gonna move forward, Tony, and, and also for Stephen, you know, you need to stop and think what's important. Um, how am I gonna get this ship back on an even keel? Focus on what you can control um, and, and get the right support and the right people around you. So, so to the ADA, thank you, um, Alex, or as always, you know, magnificent, Tony, Dan, and Stephen, really appreciate your input. I, I always enjoy it when I know I'm in the company of people who really know their stuff. And uh, I certainly felt that, that this morning. We've had some really great feedback, There's some great stuff that um, people generously in the feed have shared 
um, about government resources and the like. So I'll make sure that gets to the ADA and that can be distributed with the names and contact details of our panellists so that if you would like to follow up, um, you can. Now, David Hallett, we are perfectly, yes. perfectly on time. Which, 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 which is my biggest surprise of the morning, um, but, but back to you. Well, I had a bank of questions that could actually stretch this out for a lot longer if you like, but I, I won't do that. Um, personally, I've listened to a lot of webinars over the last few weeks. So I've sought a lot of advice from accountants, financial planners, HR experts. I don't think I'm being biased in saying that I believe what I've just listened to in the last 45 minutes or so has been the most informative of everything that I've heard. And I'm really proud that ADAWA could be part of this, David. So I thank you personally very much. And I also thank all the panelists. I thank Alex, Tony, Stephen and Dan for their time and their remarkable insights. And I really, really thank you for the ability now for my members to engage with all of you. So thank you very much. And let's keep staying positive. Thank you.